In 1897, Irish writer Bram Stoker wrote Dracula, and just like that, a horror legend was born, which has been terrifying readers for over a century. Jump to 1995 and comedy legend, the one and only Mel Brooks decided to make his own funny version, with Dracula dead and loving it. The movie featured an all-star cast, including Brooks himself as Van Helsing, the superb Leslie Nielsen as Count Dracula, Peter McNichol as Renfield, and Amy Yazbek as Mina, who is cursed to wear a chastity belt. Oh, whoops, sorry, wrong Mel Brooks movie. So yeah, Dracula Dead and Loving It joyfully makes fun of the Dracula legend, from the old Universal Monster movie days, to the Hammer Horror era, and even the 1992 Francis Ford Coppola movie. Yep, no Dracula interpretation is free from the joyful buffoonery of Mel Brooks. But despite that, Dracula Dead and Loving It didn't do too well when it was released. Could it have just been an unfortunate and underrated movie? Or, by the time this comedy horror came out, did Brooks lose his spark? Well, today we are going to find out by looking into 10 things that you didn't know about Dracula dead and loving it. So let's explore the funny side of Bram Stoker's original tale and check it out. Number 10, Dracula Dead and Loving It started as a serious movie. Yeah, believe it or not, but Dracula Dead and Loving It started as a serious movie. Well, sort of. The more accurate way to describe it is that it was the offspring of a serious movie. You feeling confused? Well, don't worry, I'll explain. You see, Dracula Dead and Loving It was written by Ruby DeLuca and Steve Haberman. DeLuca in particular had already had involvement with several movies, including Caveman and Transylvania 65000. At the time, the two writers were writing a movie called Not Human, which was a serious horror science fiction script. But while writing the script, the two writers kept fighting the urge to add jokes and funny gags. So in order to get the comedy out of their system, they worked on another script simultaneously, which was full of jokes and parodies. So when they went back to work on Not Human, they had exorcised all their comedy antics into the other script. That other script became the script for Dracula Dead and Loving It. The script found its way to Mel Brooks, and he made some of his own rewrites to the script, as well as becoming Dracula Dead and Loving It's producer and director, as well as starring in it. As with most of his movies, Mel Brooks was very hands-on. Rudy DeLuca had actually already co-written several Mel Brooks movies, including Silent Movie, High Anxiety, and Life Stinks. And just like that, in an attempt to purge the needs to write jokes, Dracula Dead and Loving It was created. Number 9. Original Concept in Dracula Dead and Loving It's early days of production, a meeting was held between the movie's crew to discuss the creative aspects of the movie. During this meeting, it was suggested that Dracula Dead and Loving It should be filmed in black and white, specifically for two reasons. One, to pay homage to the 1930s Universal Monster Movie days of cinema, but also because of Mel Brooks' previous horror comedy Young Frankenstein, which was also shot in black and white. And admittedly, I can see Dracula Dead and Loving It being filmed in black and white, with it working. However, it was decided to film the movie in colour, so Dracula Dead and Loving It can also make fun of, slash, pay respect to other Dracula movies that were filmed in colour, particularly the Hammer Horror Dracula movies. So instead, Dracula Dead and Loving It was full of bright, saturated colours. There are actually several comedies that were originally going to be shot in black and white to add to comedic value. Another being the movie Airplane. Number 8. Original choice to play the lead. Without a doubt, Leslie Nielsen was a comedy genius who never delivered an unfunny performance. Even if he was starring in an unfunny movie, he still managed to deliver the laughs on cue. Ever since his hilariously straight-faced performance in Airplane, the man was a beacon of delivering the cinematic LOLs. 
and Dracula dead and loving it was no exception, where he throws himself all out into the part to display the funniest side of the ultimate Prince of Darkness. However, he wasn't the original choice to play Dracula in Dracula Dead and Loving It. That was, in fact, Kelsey Grammer, who was much younger than Nielsen and starred in the popular sitcom Fraser at the time. So it would have made sense to go with him thanks to his Fraser popularity. However, Grammer didn't end up starring in the ghoulish part, so it went to the ever-reliable Leslie Nielsen. However, if you're curious what a supernatural creature being played by Kelsey Grammer would be like, then there's always that time he played Beast in X-Men Last Stand. Yeah, you know, that X-Men movie that everyone loves. <laughs> Alright, come on guys, it was just a joke. Alright, calm down, I'm sorry, it was a joke. Okay, it was a bad joke. However, there are some conflicting reports, as supposedly Stephen Weber, who played Jonathan Harker in Dead and Loving It, said that Kelsey Grammer was originally offered his role of Jonathan, but who knows? Number 7. Oldest Dracula So yeah, while we're on the topic of Leslie Nielsen's portrayal of Count Dracula, he was actually 68 at the time of filming, making him the oldest actor to play the part of Dracula. Okay, there is nearly a tie with Bela Lugosi, who although was about 49 to 50 when he first played Dracula in 1931, Lugosi would reprise the role in Abbott and Costello meets Frankenstein in 1948, in which he would have been in his late 60s, presumably 66 to 67, of which Nielsen would have just beaten him as the oldest Dracula. Christopher Lee would have been 36 when he was cast in the part, Frank Langella would have been about 40 or 41 when he played the role in that 1979 movie, and Gary Oldman would have been 34 when he played Dracula in Bram Stoker's Dracula in 1992. So yeah, Dracula Dead and Loving It may not have made waves when it was first released, and maybe it still doesn't now, but at least Leslie Nielsen broke the title of Eldest Dracula. Sadly, Nielsen passed away in 2010 at the age of 84, and the world lost a comedy legend. Dracula Dead and Loving It was actually his second horror movie spoof, after The Exorcist spoof, Repossessed. And after Dracula, he would continue to star in horror spoofs, including Scary Movie 3 and 4 and Stan Helsing. Number 6. Filming Dracula Dead and Loving It was filmed at Culver Studios in Culver City, California, with filming lasting about four months. Yep, just like Francis Ford Coppola's Bram Stoker's Dracula before it, Dead and Loving It was also creating old-school horse and carriage Europe in modern-day California, with many sets being built to create the time period and atmosphere. Apparently, when it came to the characters of Dead and Loving It, the male characters were to be depicted as buffoons, complete and utter idiots, and the female characters were to be glamorous and sexy. British actress Lizette Anthony, who played Lucy, said, according to IMDb, was to just stand there and look sexy, with her cleavage on display. Okay, it wasn't exactly worded like that, but hey, I'm trying to keep things PG here. But she also added that she didn't mind it at all or take offence, but instead felt really lucky to be working with Mel Brooks, calling him one of the comic greats of our time. And let's be honest, she's right. Mel Brooks is a comedy genius. From most accounts I've read, filming Dracula Dead and Loving It was a positive and fun experience for all involved. Number 5. Mel Brooks would return to Dracula Yep, believe it or not, but Mel Brooks would return to the legend of Dracula, and just like Dead and Loving It, he'd return to a more light-hearted side of the tale where in 2015, a whole 20 years after the release of Dracula Dead and Loving It, Mel Brooks would voice the part of Dracula's father, Vlad, in the computer animated movie Hotel Transylvania 2, where as mentioned, he played the father to Adam Sandler's Dracula character. Even though Mel Brooks isn't directing movies anymore, it's still nice to see him pop up and get involved in movies every now and then. Number 4. Who Needs Milk When You've Got Blood? So there were two movie posters used to promote Dracula Dead and Loving It. And both posters were pretty orange. No, seriously, don't look at me like that, it's true. They are pretty orange, right? First up, there's this one, which shows Leslie Nielsen's Dracula loving afterlife and looking really happy, with other characters from the movie shown within his torso. And then there's this other poster that is a direct spoof of the Bram Stoker's Dracula poster, which came out a few years earlier. And I love this one. <laughs> Look at Nielsen's face, that's classic. 
another advertising gimmick was also used to make fun of the Got Milk campaign, which was a marketing strategy from the 90s to entice the public to drinking milk by using photos of celebrities with milk moustaches, suggesting that they have just drunk a glass of milk, while the ad would describe the health benefits of drinking milk. However, Dracula Dead and Loving It made its own comical version of the campaign called Got Blood, which comically featured the health benefits of drinking blood, along with a blood smear on Leslie Nielsen's upper lip, just like the milk smears on the Got Milk adverts. It's a funny satire of the campaign, as it kind of shows you that Dracula has entered the world of the 90s. Be that 90s marketing, only he's not drinking milk but going straight for the blood. Number 3. The Trailer Recycled Music from Another Dracula Movie So if you watch the early teaser trailer of Dracula Dead and Loving It, you may very well be greeted with familiar music, as the trailer used music from the 1979 Dracula movie, which was scored by the legendary John Williams himself. Which is pretty fascinating, as the 1979 Dracula movie is anything but a comedy. However, early movie trailers using scores from other movies wasn't an uncommon practice back then. It was something that happened when very early trailers were put together, but the music for the movies weren't ready, so scores from other movies would be used for the early trailers, to help set the mood and showcase what kind of movie to expect. That's why in the 80s there was lots of trailers for adventure movies that featured music from The NeverEnding Story. And during the 90s, there were equally tons of movie trailers that featured the Beetlejuice score, especially if they were supernatural comedies. Heck, even the teaser trailer for A Muppet's Christmas Carol used the Beetlejuice theme. One of my favourite cases of pre-existing movie scores being used for a trailer is the teaser trailer for Hook, which used the theme for The Witches of Eastwick. Point is, there are tons of early movie trailers from the 80s and 90s that uses scores from other movies. In fact, I am surprised that the Dracula Didn't Loving It trailer didn't use the as mentioned Beetlejuice score. It would have seemed like the perfect fit. Speaking of music, the score for Dracula Dead and Loving It was composed by Humi Mann, and his music in the movie doesn't at all sound like the kind of music you'll hear in a spoof movie, but it actually sounds quite serious, <laughs> which I guess is part of the gag. It does, however, sound delightfully gothic. Mann also scored Robin Hood Men in Tights, but is probably best known for creating music for the TV show Moonlighting. Number 2. Dracula Dead and Loving It was meant to compete against another vampire movie. Dracula Dead and Loving It was being distributed by Castle Rock Entertainment, which was co-founded by director Rob Reiner, and the company had released several successful movies, including Misery, When Harry Met Sally, A Few Good Men, and The Shawshank Redemption and their plan was to release Dracula Dead and Loving It during the Halloween season, so it could compete with fellow vampire comedy, Vampire in Brooklyn, which starred Eddie Murphy and was directed by horror legend Wes Craven. Yep, during Halloween 1995, audiences could have been coming face to face with two funny vampires. However, by the time Halloween was on the horizon, Dracula Dead and Loving It just wasn't ready, with principal photography lasting till September, which meant the movie wasn't ready to be released till December. There are some who believe that releasing Dracula Dead and Loving It two months after Halloween may have hurt the movie's box office, and that the movie probably would have performed better if it was actually released on Halloween. But then again, maybe not as Vampire in Brooklyn was released on Halloween, and that film also didn't do very well. Number 1. The box office was dead, and the critics weren't loving it. Dracula Dead and Loving It was released on December the 22nd, 1995. As mentioned, a weird movie to release over Christmas. It was also released just after the 21st anniversary of Brooks' previous horror comedy, Young Frankenstein, which came out all the way back in 1974. Sadly, Dead and Loving It was a box office disaster, only bringing in $10.7 million on a $30 million budget. Yeah, ouch. Which is really bad, especially when compared to Brooks' previous movie, Robin Hood Men in Tights, which made $70 million. The movie also got negative reviews from critics, who chimed in that you'll only like Dracula Dead and Loving It if you're a hardcore Mel Brooks fan. Otherwise, don't bother. 
Many other critics felt that although Dead and Loving It can raise some giggles, it just isn't particularly funny, and it was often unfairly compared to Brooks' previous horror comedy Young Frankenstein, and to Nielsen's previous efforts in Airplane and The Naked Gun. And it currently has a measly 11% on Rotten Tomatoes. What adds to the sadness of Dracula Dead and Loving It's failings is that this would be Mel Brooks' last film that he would direct. His final curtain bow, if you will. It's a shame that it ended on a whimper and not a standing ovation. But maybe it's fitting, as when it came to breaking the rules and expectations, that was kind of his thing. So where did it go wrong? Well, maybe it was just bad timing. Who knows, as mentioned, if it was released on Halloween, it may have done better, as people would have been in the right mood for it. And who knows, maybe if it was made closer to the release of Bram Stoker's Dracula, it also may have fared better, as it would have been topical and ripe for a spoof. But by the time Dead and Loving It came out, Bram Stoker's Dracula was three years old, and probably not on everyone's minds anymore. But I've noticed that over the years that Dead and Loving It has picked up a loyal fan base by fans who do enjoy it and find it funny. So it's not all bad. And I personally do enjoy the movie. There are parts that really do make me chuckle. And I think that it makes an excellent double bill with Men in Tights. Whether you like Dracula Dead and Loving It or not, one thing is for sure. It marked the end of a directing career for a brilliant filmmaker and a pioneer of the comedy and spoof genre. But that said, Mel Brooks is thankfully still with us. So who knows, maybe one day he will direct another movie. But regardless, Dracula Dead and Loving It may be a film that only Mel Brooks fans will appreciate. Well, that's not a bad thing, as there does seem to be lots of Mel Brooks fans. So the movie does have worth and merit. And a few chuckles here and there as well. Anyway, I'm Minty. And when you think about it, it's actually quite incredible that there hasn't been more Dracula spoofs. Where are they? See ya!